Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Ranu Raichaudhry. She comes to Yale from the Indian Institute of Technology in Guwahati, where she is Assistant Professor of Humanities and Social Sciences. She is a historian of photography and art with interest in South Asian studies, post-colonial theory, popular visual culture, and intellectual history of art. Today, we'll talk with Professor Roy Chaudhry about her paper, Photographs of People, Monument for a City. Welcome, Ranu. Thank you so much, Marilyn, for having me here today. So let's begin with an overview of your paper. Tell us about it. The paper is on our intertwined history of visual conventions, political commitment, and intellectual orientation vis-a-vis -vis arguably the longest running photo documentary project on the city of Calcutta, titled People of Calcutta. Mm -hmm. uh, it, the project began in 1977 and ran through early 1991. And it was done in two phases. The first part of the project was called Shahid Minar, and it's translated as Monument of Martyrs. And the second phase was uh, Ghore Bayre. It can be translated as the home and the world. Okay. And these two parts under the larger rubric of people of Calcutta was done um, under the the umbrella of a Jesuit organization called Chitrabani. Mm -hmm. And the word Chitrabani is a Bangla word, which you can translate as uh, words and images. Uh, but you also can translate in other ways. And also it was a uh, word that was used by the Nobel laureate uh, Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore mm -hmm. to uh, talk about cinema. So okay. that would also have been part of why this institution was named um, Chichabani. And uh, so the institution was an offshoot of uh, the St. Xavier's College in Calcutta. Mm -hmm. And the Jesuits have a like long history in the city. And they had like long investments both in time and um, in terms of time as well as in terms of the breadth of it in um, education and social projects. Mm -hmm. So so this was just an offshoot, yet another offshoot. But the interesting, most interesting part is this is the, the, the world we are talking um, after the Vatican Second Council, which okay. is like the early 1960s. And what happened uh, in the Vatican Second Council is uh, the Catholic Church uh, started incorporating non-Christians within the larger fold of uh, the Christian preaching. Also, it started to deal with what was then the new media, which is now the old media. Okay. So how to incorporate the non-Christians and also how to incorporate uh, new media in um, the church activities. So, and with that kind of an orientation, the Catholic Church had uh, the Canadian priest of Belgian origin, Father Gusto Rubesh, who moved to Calcutta in the uh, 60s sent to uh, UCLA for a degree in film and media. Mm -hmm. So he got his degree, he goes back to Calcutta and starts this organization in 19, uh, early 1970s. Okay. Right? So, and followed by that, there were series of national emergencies in India. Uh, and that, as you know, is a suspension of um, democratic uh, rights of the citizen. And there was ban on photography and more generally media activities. So okay. the organization had to stall their program of launching this uh, documentary project, which they then had to wait till 1977 for the emergency to go over and so that they could start, go out in the public and photograph stuff that mm -hmm. wasn't possible under the emergency. Okay. So uh, initially they had a plan of making um, audiovisual documentaries, but it's also a time when the, the government of India had a 20, a 200 person input duty on film stocks. So they could not uh, like afford to get a lot of films. So mm -hmm. and they started with cut films from local film industry and also depended on donation from other sources for celluloid films that they can use. So eventually crunching resources forced them to move into steel photographs. And that's how the whole project began. Now, uh, the reason for um, creating this huge body of photographs, and you'll be surprised to know the number, a total of 12,000 photographs. Wow, I was uh, yes, getting ready yes. to ask you. Yes, 12,000, wow. That, that is a lot. That's the total oeuvre of Chichwani collection, mm -hmm. but for only, if you focus only on people of Calcutta project, it's 4,000. Okay. Still, 
it's not less. Right. If you're dealing with uh, 4,000 photographs, that means negatives, friends, and also they had index cards, mm -hmm. and they have everything catalogued. So you're basically dealing with a lot of mm -hmm. information. Right, and, right. and managing that information so that the posterity can access that information 40 years down the line. Mm -hmm. And I was the person who accessed. And so yeah, so uh, going back to why this project was launched, like there was a theological aspect of it. So theology of communication was a major impetus in mm -hmm. conceiving this project, following from the Vatican Second Council. Right. It also was uh, fostered by a social commitment to giving face to the faceless, and that was sort of a tagline for the entire project mm -hmm. in two periods. And I'll come to the right because I do want to know who. I want you to describe some of the photographs and who these people are. Absolutely, I'll come to that. Okay. But uh, so when you say face to the faceless, what kind of people are you thinking about? Mm -hmm. It's really the everyday lives of very ordinary citizens of Calcutta who otherwise would not have photographs made like so the first part was specially focused on economically marginalized section <laughs> of Calcutta okay and the second part was more sort of a middle class but okay. but when they focus turned their camera to the middle class it's not the the high achieving middle class that they were thinking about they were talking about more sort of like everyday people in the city and okay. their everyday very banal mundane lives mm -hmm. of, and a lot of acts of everyday living that we won't photograph. Even mm -hmm. in today's day of Instagram and camera phone, there mm -hmm. are certain acts we think it's just too banal to be photographed, right? right. You need an event mm -hmm. to capture it through sure. the camera. So yeah, so, so there are two segments. So first part is underprivileged Calcutta, and the second part is uh, the middle class Calcutta. So and the uh, face for the faceless is more sort of the for the first section but i also feel that sa same thought can be extended to thinking about the middle class okay. and as i said i mean we are talking about a pre-digital era where even the middle class not all of them would have a camera for to themselves sure. to document their say like doing laundry as as simple as that mm -hmm. but it's a very important ritual of daily living. Right. So they would not have the instrument to record that daily living. And so that was the kind of phase that uh, the Ghore Bairi segment of people of Calcutta uh, gave an opportunity to people to have an image of, mm -hmm. so which wasn't possible before. So and uh, so that that was one goal. The second goal was to counter the contemporary international as well as national understanding of Calcutta as a post-colonial dystopia. Mm -hmm. So uh, so they were uh, they were thinking Calcutta as a cityscape, as a space, as people's lived experience, mm -hmm. not simply in terms of city of palaces or worst of urban disasters. So right. if those are the two polarizing world. They were uh, like intervening somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. and trying to say that, well, sure. I mean, the world is not perfect. There are problems. Yeah, there are sure dystopic moments, but that does not necessarily make people hopeless. Mm -hmm. It also kind of a moment to reflect on the resilience of the people who live in the city and mm -hmm. fight back a lot of societal as well as urban injustices. Mm -hmm. So when you're thinking about the urban poor, it's not simply the poor as as the wretched, mm -hmm. as a somebody who we should look down upon. It's it's also the photographs were also meant to restore humanity and dignity to the people. Right. So for them making a photograph of the people, so unintended city, th that's what they call, uh, to photograph an unintended city is to restore humanity and restore dignity to these people. Mm -hmm. So that was a major impetus. And when they're looking at the middle class, it was an interesting moment because most of the photographers, and I should have mentioned before, a uh, majority of the photographers were not Catholics. Okay. And, and pretty much all of them aligned themselves with some sort of leftist activism. Okay. There were a few people who were car card carrying members of the Communist Party of India, but most were not card carrying yet, say, would vote the CPIM in the elections. Mm -hmm. but, so they had a broad, uh, like left leaning, broadly speaking, and it, I mean, left in the broadest part of civil scope when I say this. Okay. So, um, so yeah, so these photographers, when they started photographing the middle class, they were in a way also looking at themselves. Mm -hmm. So it's 
it's also going back home and photographing their acts of leaving. So a lot of photograph came out of, of their own homes. Okay. So somebody's dad sipping tea in the morning mm -hmm. or somebody's um, relative folding clothes. I mean, as simple as these acts were getting documented. So, uh, so if the first part was kind of looking into the other side of Calcutta mm -hmm. for the photographers and also the middle class viewers of those photographs, the second part was like a really reflexive moment for this entire practice of documenting the city. Mm -hmm. so. Okay, and so, Minimally, 4,000 um, photographs for Calcutta. Mm -hmm. Where are these photographs now, and how did you orient yourself to them? What was the process like for you? Right. So all photographs, negatives, and the prints that were made in the 70s through the 90s, and the, in the index cards that I mentioned, and they are absolutely central. So they would make these tiny little cards, put them on this index, and on the side they will actually have the technical details. So we mm -hmm. actually have the darkroom details of the wow. kind of chemical they used, the kind of films they use, and uh, the kind of camera. So we actually have the details. Like, And of course, the many of the photographers are still around. Okay. So if you talk to the photographer, and then you take a look at the index card, it actually gives a sense of what went behind the scene mm -hmm. even before this print called it, the, the object called photograph came into being in this world. So Wait. this entire thing is in Anka, Calcutta. Uh -huh. In, in Chitrapani archive, uh, which is uh, in um, Rafi Ahmed Khidwai Road, that's pretty much in central Calcutta. Okay. So how many, how many photo photographers did you get a chance to speak with? Oh, I was very lucky. So, I mean, they had 23 photographers. I got a chance to talk to, I think, like 15 or 16. Wow, wow. So how, so how old would bad. they be now? Uh, they're like, it, it varies really. Mm -hmm. So from a late 50s through mid 70s. So okay. that's sort of the age right, range. Right. Okay. And did you talk to them about it was what it was like for them to participate in the project? Oh, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, when they participated, most of them were like very young, mm -hmm. fresh graduates. Or in, in some cases, there was one person who was a uh, like college dropout and he was very proud. I mean, he's still very proud. Mm -hmm. And he is like one of the finest photographers of our time. Mm -hmm. um, so these, uh, they were um, like still developing their skill and um, they were really committed to the idea of social justice. Mm -hmm. So uh, it wasn't like unnatural. They would go to Chichabani and mm -hmm. joined this, join this project. So the first generation of photographer who worked for uh, the Shahid Minar uh, section of uh, the project, I mean, there was a, advertisement that went out asking photographers to join. Second generation of photographers were trained by the first generation of photographers. So when this project started, they also started a photography training course along with it. Mm -hmm. So the second generation were more sort of like in-house trained. But the first generation who like were initially joined from outside, they were also refining their skills. Mm -hmm. So it's a moment of, um, for them, it was moments of discovery self-discovery as well as discovery the medium mm -hmm. and their personal relationship with the medium and how to go about it. And most of them like became professionals later on and majority of them st uh, went on with still photography, some went with moving picture, uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, moving picture photography. So yeah. So, uh, you know, in terms of um, the project, I would imagine multiple um, photos would have been taken. Mm -hmm. So I'm wondering what the uh, how the photos were ultimately chosen to be part of the project. Who right. was tasked with that? Uh -huh. That's an excellent question. Thank you. I mean, again, we are talking about a pre-digital world mm -hmm. in a in a resource care region where you can't really afford to take a lot of photographs. You mm -hmm. have to be very precise. Okay. And so it's not like you have option of taking ten shots of a thing and then you delete nine, keep one, or uh, keep four, delete the rest. 10 is, 10, 10 means a lot. I mean, uh, so a case like celluloid uh, cassettes mm -hmm. of uh, films would have 36 gates and often people would uh, economize it so that you, they get at least like 39. Mm -hmm. It's possible to do that, but you have to be really very precise. Okay. And if film stocks, like the, if cost is high, there's not like, so there weren't multiple shots. In okay. most cases, there were like at most like three shots, mm -hmm. but in mostly it was like one, two. Okay. That was the limit. Mm -hmm. So 
in that way, I mean, for us, often it becomes really difficult to choose which one we want to keep. For them, it was like relatively manageable in terms of number, okay. but in terms of aesthetic choices and in terms of what they really wanted to portray in the photographs, it wasn't as easy a process. Mm -hmm. I mean, it well, was so there were discussions. Okay. So they would go out in the field, make photographs, come back, work in the dark room, develop them, and they would do the dark room themselves. So it's not like they would send them to lab. So okay. Chichabani had its own very equipped lab. So um, yeah, so they would work in the dark room and then. Um, make contact sheets out of them because that's that was we are again we mm -hmm, are talking of about course. a period where I remember those days <laughs> uh, thank you so much you know <laughs> often I mean just distracting from what we are talking it becomes very difficult to talk to students and often I carry mm -hmm. contact sheets with me when I'm talking contact sheets because they have no clue what I'm talking exactly, about they yeah. have no and you like, have the little loop that you get out uh, yeah, to magnify totally. it absolutely yeah. So, um, and students, like young students, first year, second years, they often don't have a clue that mm -hmm. I'm really talking about an object, a physical thing that you yes. can hold in your hand and not a computer screen. Anyway, mm -hmm. going back to the point. So they would uh, develop make contact sheets and they would have, like they would all sit together, the, ment the seniors and the mentors, if there were any from outside. Sometimes there would be like volunteers who would come to uh, work with Chichabani mm -hmm. group. And uh, they would oft, uh, also participate. And of course, Father Rubesh. Okay. So Father Rubesh was a really monumental figure in, in this uh, entire institution and in the project. So, so everybody's input was essential. And, and there would be people like, say, Satyajit Ray, the Indian auteur. I mean, he was closely associated with the, uh, the institution. I mean, sometime Father Rubesh would so, uh, show some photographs to Ray and Ray would comment on that. Mm -hmm. So, and there were like many people like uh, coming and going at some point. Orika the Abreso was there. So, and they would have like a uh, discussion with Bresso, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, Kathy Abreso is a very common uh, sort of interlocutor, both intellectually and like in real life. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, so they, they would discuss that what is the objective that I went out to field with and how, w how is it that I'm contributing to a positive image of the people that I'm photographing. Mm -hmm. So these discussions would actually lead into the kinds of photograph they want to keep or they want to throw away. Let me tell you, they didn't throw away any, so they have the entire collection there. Okay. So yeah, and but for exhibition purposes, they would choose like handful, but you also have to think about the printing costs, right. so the chemical cost. I mean, all these things were also part of the story behind how many photographs would actually make it to, say, a gallery exhibition, mm -hmm. or would actually be sold out to people who would come to buy prints. Okay. So, so I am uh, curious if the people of Calcutta themselves, how many do you think were able to see these photographs? Yes, that's uh, a question about circulation. Mm. So uh, initially, all these photographs were meant to be uh, seen by the people who were depicted in the photographs. So mm -hmm. community exhibition was a major ch uh, channel through which these photographs were seen by the mm -hmm. people. So, so they would, t again, take photograph, come back, develop, and go back with the photographs. Okay. So most people went back, some people didn't. Also, I mean, they have their personal narrative of, of why they didn't go back. I mean, yeah, but, and, but even without thinking about how many people actually saw it, I think it's important to think of, uh, from the perspective of the institution, the photographers, that they really had an intention that the widest possible like group would actually come see mm -hmm. their photographs. So they would reach out to the communities rather than expecting communities to come to them and see the photographs. Okay. Uh, apart from the community exhibitions, uh, a lot of these photographs have traveled uh, through the Catholic circuits, through the church circuits, okay. uh, across the country and also out of the country. Where did it go outside of uh, the country? Belgium. So okay. Belgium, because uh, uh, so Father Rubesh had a like French Canadian of mm -hmm. Belgian origin. So Belgium, Canada, are some of the uh, places where these photographs travel. Also, mm -hmm. there was one person um, you know, who was based in Montreal. He's still based in Montreal. And he was in Calcutta for the longest period of time. And during the initial year, he, years, he was one of the mentors. Mm -hmm. so, so this person was there, was actively engaged in the project. And, so photo and he took his photographs back when he moved back to Montreal. So, so there are channels through which the circuit Within mm -hmm. Calcutta, there were two major 
uh, gallery exhibition, one in early 1980s, another in early 1990s. So okay. the, uh, the 80s, 18, 1980s uh, exhibition was on like the first project, uh -huh. uh, like the first section of the project, and the early 90s exhibition was on the second part of the project. So, so there are multiple channels through which these photographs circulated, and Father Rubesh, as well as the photographers, really wanted to reach out to different segments, different classes mm -hmm. of people um, to visually educate them about how to look at a photograph. Right, so, right. Yeah. So ultimately, um, do you think the objective of the project actually worked? It really depends. I mean, it's an interesting question, and this is a question I keep getting whenever I talk about this project to others, because not a lot of people know that this institution existed right. or this photograph still exists mm -hmm. out there, and people still are very attached to what they made. So the photographers are very attached to the photographs they made like sure. 50 years back. So. Um, there were twofold objectives. So one was to make a difference in people's lives. The other objective was to create a body of photographs, mm -hmm. right? That would remain as uh, for the posterity as this moment in the, uh, the city's, like along, like three decades in city's lives. Mm -hmm. And um, so the first objective, like making a difference in people's life, how was it expected to happen? Like how can a photograph be like really instrumental in changing, mm -hmm. changing real life situation. Well, so Father Rubesh had a very good answer for that. So for him, it's really uh, like restore by restoring dignity. It's giving people a positive sense of self, giving people hope that they are worthy members of the society, mm -hmm. no matter what like the hegemonic discourses in the society make them believe, they still have um, equal share in, in resources. Mm -hmm in a public life, in public spaces, and asserting that right for them was uh, seen as a major positive state uh, for um, the Chichibani uh, collective. Mm -hmm. I mean, they didn't formally call them a collective, but I, mean, I call them a sure. collective with a small c rather than a uppercase c. Right. So yeah, so I think that happened, mm -hmm. like, I mean, if you ask me, I would say, yeah, I mean, I see the point and it really contributed positively in the question of human development. Mm -hmm. And of course, they created this huge archive of images. I mean, that's like, as a researcher, I find it pretty incredible. Invaluable. Absolutely, but then, if you go back to the photographers and if you ask them or if you ask Father Rubesh, they all have their different um, answers. So for majority of the photographers, mm -hmm. um, also it's interesting how over time their answers changed. So so there was one photographer who said, oh, photographs can't make any change in anybody's life. So it was, we were just kids, we were making photographs and we were very happy about our aesthetic uh, pursuits. Mm -hmm. Another group of people, the majority of them would say like, oh, we tried our best, but you it wasn't really successful. Now, this version is from 2006. I interviewed this same group in 2013 again, and they said, oh, we were definitely partially successful. Hmm. You ask Father Rubesh, he said, oh, we were moderately successful, mm -hmm. and uh, he's still committed to the idea. So, so what is this real change that we are talking about? Does real change mean that, I mean, the underprivileged would suddenly one fine morning uh, become a, a more um, economically resourceful person? Mm -hmm. Or are we talking about like change in their vision of themselves? Mm -hmm. So what is Empowered this Empower them, change? perhaps. Yeah, exactly, so empowerment can happen at different level, mm -hmm. right? So when we say real, we often like associate rea real with material. And I, as a researcher, I see even if there's no material gain, through these photographs, there are a lot of empowerment that definitely happened. Right, yeah. right, okay. So final question, you yeah. are here at Yale at the Institute mm -hmm. of Sacred Music doing right. some work, so tell us uh, what you're working on. Uh, well, uh, the, m my project at Institute of Sacred Music is was a was kind of a shoot off from this paper okay. and my larger book, book project. So uh, the project at ISM, it's called uh, Theology, politics, art, photographs from post-emergency Calcutta. So, and here, 
in the project, I'm specifically looking at theology of communication. And that is something I did not explore earlier in my research. So I was more concerned about the photographers, mm -hmm. the photographs they were making. So my focus was more towards these objects and the images and the materiality uh, of a photographic image, more generally speaking. But now I'm actually looking into theology of communication because Father Rubesh wrote a lot. And not simply that, I mean, he was squarely located within this, like, bigger discussion mm -hmm. within what is now Global South and what at the other, other point was the, the third world. So, and there was like a, a, like a series of journals that published theology of communication mm -hmm. in the third world. So I'm looking into those discursive spaces and um, Father Rubesh's location in that kind of a global discussion and then try to think about the photographs and the, this uh, theology of communication together. Okay. So, yeah, so my current project is pretty much kind of um, began while I was working with this huge body of mm -hmm. photographs. Well, we will certainly look forward to hearing more from you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here. It was really fascinating. Oh, thanks again for okay. having me. For more information about Professor Roy Choudhury and her work, please visit our website at macmillanreport.yale.edu. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.